Welcome to the Lead More Podcast. I'm your host, John T. Meyer. The Lead More Podcast is the show where we sit down and talk with leaders of today to help inspire the leaders of tomorrow. Because I believe the world needs more leaders. And in episode 17, we sat down and talked with one of my favorite leaders, Maddie Pashong. Maddie is an entrepreneur and a small business owner. She has a podcast, she has great online content, she runs a coaching program. Um, she's doing a bunch of things and is really just a, a solo person but doing big things. So we sat down and talked to Maddie about what was it like to make the leap to go from the, the safe day job to going out on your own, how she's developed all these multiple streams of revenue, the challenges of running this type of business that lead and inspires others during the challenging 2020 year that we live in. And I also asked her, what does this look like in the future? What does the business look like this look like as she continues to grow? I know you're going to learn something from Maddie. So let's go listen to the conversation now. All right. Welcome to another episode of the Lead More podcast. I'm here with my friend, Maddie Pashong, small business owner, entrepreneur. How are you? I'm good, John. Thanks for having me. Yeah. And I should not new mom. You already were a mom, but mom of a new one. You have a yes. eight, eight week old little girl. Yes. Yeah. Yep. So that's our third that we just added. And she so far is such a delightful, awesome baby. So she's going pretty easy on us so far. Good. Good. Yeah. It's, I always think that like, if you, if you have a really good one then that starts to tempt you into like, Oh, maybe we could do this again. Right. Or if you have a bad one, you're it's like, we're really done. really dangerous. It's very dangerous. <laughs> that's great. Well, I'm excited to talk to you today. Uh, you, I think are, uh, uh, definitely a leader, but an interesting leader in a sense where, um, you're kind of a solopreneur, but you inspire and lead others through your content, through your coaching. And so we're going to dive into that today. But let's start a little bit with your origin story. You graduated from college and, and got right into marketing, right? I did. Yeah. So I graduated from college and I um, had a, I have a degree in mass communications and journalism and also graphic design. And I was really interested in um, all things communication. PR was really interesting to me, social media, um, just all of the different ways that people were starting to communicate differently um, at the time that I graduated. And social media was definitely a huge part of that. So within, um, I had probably about six or nine months where I was just kind of doing odd jobs and looking for a more um, permanent home. And after um, a few months, I accepted a job at Wells Enterprises in Lamar's, Iowa, doing all of the social media for their brands, uh, the biggest one being Blue Bunny Ice Cream. And it truly was so much of a dream job to work for really a national brand company to control um, the, the social media for that brand. So to really be able to control or, or have a major say in that messaging um, and really a direct line to the consumer. And so I learned a ton in that position. I always joke that I was probably given a lot more responsibility than I should have had at 22 years old, but I learned so much. And all these corporate um, brands just put like the 20 something in charge of social media because they didn't know what much, to do. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think that's exactly what happened. <laughs> that's great. Yeah. And so I was there for a while for about two years. Um, and my husband and I, so we are originally from South Dakota. Mm -hmm. And after a couple of years in small town Iowa, which I really enjoyed, we just kind of started talking more about like having a family and where we wanted to be when we did that. And um, the thought of coming back to South Dakota kind of came up and we couldn't really um, forget about it. So sure. decided to start pursuing moving back and Sioux Falls had always been a place that we like enjoyed visiting and we had a ton of friends there um, from high school and college. So um, after we, we moved to Sioux Falls and again, I kind of had a little bit of in between time where I was doing some odd jobs. And then after a few months, I accepted a position at a uh, um, digital marketing agency in mm -hmm. downtown Sioux Falls. And yeah. so it, it's interesting going from like a large company in house to that um, the agency side when I was at, when I was in the corporate world, I, I mean, I don't think anybody knew how old I was because I was easily, I, there was one person in the company who was as young as I was, but otherwise I was quite significantly like sure. the youngest person. <laughs> sure. And so I didn't, you know, meant, like talk about my age or how old I was or anything like that. And then you go to a 
like hip young marketing agency. And I'm like, I'm like not even close to the youngest person here and I'm 25. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it was an interesting um, transition, but really to be totally honest, another dream job, um, got to work with really amazing clients. I worked on the account side and so um, got that direct line to our clients to be able to chat with them about marketing initiatives and how we could grow their brand and their business in the online space and um, worked with a really incredible team of people. So that was definitely a huge part of why I enjoyed my time there so much. And I was there for three years and um, then transitioned out of that position to do my own thing full time. And that was yeah. um, that was in 2018. So it's been a couple of years now, which is pretty crazy to think about. And what would you say, um, you know, and this shows about, about leadership. So from mm -hmm. what did you learn in the corporate compared to more of the entrepreneurial agency setting, the smaller, small business, we'll say, um, as far as comparing and contrasting, how did that shape what you ended up doing now? And we'll get into that next, but. Yeah. Well, I think both, um, both positions were so like they needed to happen in my journey for for me to end up where I am today. And even like my corporate position, once I was on the agency side, it was so invaluable to have corporate experience, to be able to understand the clients that I was now working for, like the things that they were thinking about and that they were concerned about. And also the, like the internal pressures and, um, like workflows that they have to follow. I, I think I just understood that a little bit more. Um, and, that in, on the, so on the corporate side, obviously that, um, was a huge factor in just kind of me developing as, um, a leader and an entrepreneur and all of those things. And then on the agency side there, honestly, I don't know if I hadn't have had that job, if I would be in as what I like to think is a successful position as I am now. Cause I learned mm -hmm. so much about, the world of online marketing and email list building and social media and SEO and like all of these things. I had access to all of these amazing brains um, doing really incredible things for our clients. And so now I'm able to implement those in my own business, or at least I know that those possibilities exist and I can find the people who can do them better than I can. Yeah, sure. So you probably like a lot of folks in today, you know, it's kind of a ubiquitous term, but you were doing the side hustle while you were mm -hmm. at the agency. I think you had your own photography business, maybe a few other Again. things sprinkling in. Walk us through conversation with your husband, family, friends, when you're sitting there deciding, I'm going to go all in on these, these ideas and, and, and go out on my own. Tell us about that. Yeah. Well, my husband would tell you that I was driving him absolutely insane because <laughs> I, I really did love my day job. And I feel like even the term day job almost has like a negative connotation to it, but I really, I loved it. Like I, I felt valued and fulfilled and all of those things. I just think at the end of the day, I kind of have that entrepreneurial bug where like, I don't want to do something from eight to five. And like, I'm a mm -hmm. little bit of a, um, like kind of going against the grain there. Um, and so I had always, when, by the time I left my corporate position, there was a little bit of shuffle and unrest, I guess, as tends to happen in the corporate world, there were layoffs and there were some like scary things happening when I left. And that kind of made me realize that it's probably not a bad idea to always have some sort of a backup plan, whether that's like a really great savings account or something that you can do on your own whatever. And because I had photography and it was a fairly successful business, I thought, well, I'll just make sure that that's in a really good place. And so that can be my backup plan if I were to lose my job or whatever. Um, and so I had always kind of been building this business to potentially be a full-time income, even when it wasn't. Mm -hmm. And because I liked the whole backup plan idea, I was constantly telling my husband like, oh, well, if I were to leave my job, I would do this or, you know, we could do this. And eventually he just said to me, Maddie, do it or stop talking about it. Like, I don't want to hear. <laughs> I mean, I remember where we were. It's great. That's good advice. Yeah. He said that. Yeah. And he was right because there, there came a point where I wasn't giving my all to either 
thing because I was spread so thin and, and that's not fair. It wasn't fair to my business and it certainly wasn't fair to my employer. So he was totally right. And that was exactly what I needed to hear to be like, okay, I need to make a decision. I need to pick one. Um, and so it was the, it, it, and by, when I decided that I was going to, you know, put in my notice, it was, I think it was about a, a week. I gave myself about a week to kind of figure out like, okay, like what do I need to say? And cause I was just so nervous. Sure. So it was a pretty quick turnaround to, you know, working at this, um, potentially climbing the ladder at this position to just kidding. I'm actually going to leave and do my own thing. Um, even though like my business was in a place where I could do that, it was a pretty quick flip of a switch, at least in my brain. And it was the most nerve wracking scariest week of my life because <laughs> I wanted to, I remember I was leaving town early that week. Um, like I was going to take the, the day off on Friday. And so I remember thinking, I'll tell them that I'm quitting on Thursday. And so then when they hate me, I won't be there on Friday and then they can have the weekend. <laughs> I mean, just ridiculous. And I knew like that that I was replaceable and that they would be fine. I knew that, but I also know that the hiring process sucks. And so I mm -hmm. just felt, I just felt bad. And I went to lunch that week with a girlfriend of mine, a coworker. And after I told her a few days later that I was leaving, she was like, was that why you were so weird at lunch the other day? <laughs> I was like, yeah, it was. You can tell, yeah, so, yeah. It was very nerve wracking, but ultimately they were so supportive. And um, I think that by that point, everybody knew that, this was the right like path for me, despite the fact that it was um, a nerve wracking one. And I was so lucky to have their support and still actually have like a working relationship with them. I do a lot of work with that company. So oh. I was pleasantly surprised, but or I shouldn't, I shouldn't even say surprised. I knew that they would have been wonderful about it. I was just a total freak. <laughs> <laughs> and I can say from, from our London experience, you know, it's always sad when like really great people leave, but it's, it's, it's also really, um, you feel a sense of pride when they're going out to maybe do their own thing. And I'm sure they feel that as well. And so that's great. That's great. Um, yeah, that was definitely the feedback that I got, which was very cool. I love those. We've learned on, on the lead more podcast here. There's a lot of moments for leaders when somebody nudges or pushes like your husband making that comment, yes. you know, and I think it's probably human nature, but I think especially for us in the Midwest, we're always trying to like protect the downside. You're like, but oh. if I do this, then I could do that, this, this, and this, or if it doesn't go well, I have this. And then, you know, you're kind of like worst yeah. case scenario. Um, so let's go to the other, the, the, the other end, like the vision. Did you, were you sort of like, I'm just going to go do my own thing and I'll figure it out. Or were you plotting day and night? Like, it's going to look like this. It's because now your business, and we'll talk about this next, has a lot of pieces to it. It's so is, different. Does it look like the way you thought it would? No, okay. <laughs> it, doesn't. it doesn't. It doesn't. And yet I kind of anticipate, I didn't anticipate everything that's happened in detail, but I also just kind of had this, um, I guess, belief that it would be good, like that it would be okay. And it would be good. And if I had, you know, the 40 hours a week, or you know, sometimes 80 hours a week, or whatever, to yep. dedicate to this job that was just, like, dependent on me, I knew that I could do something amazing. Did I know mm -hmm. what that looked like? Not at all. In fact, when I left, I was pretty I, I'm trying to remember, I think when I left, I was thinking it was going to be primarily wedding photography. And I was just starting to introduce some digital products, specifically for photographers, Lightroom presets and that sort mm -hmm. of a thing. Um, so it, it was very much focused on photography and I didn't, I didn't necessarily see that changing and I didn't see that not changing, but it has, it's changed a lot. <laughs> yeah. So I can give the you know, I can list the things that I think your business does. I mean, I know some of them, but I'll let you do it. It's your business. So yeah. walk us through two and a half years later. Let's kind of describe what your small business does. Yeah. So like I said, when I, when I left, it was kind of that focus on wedding photography, just starting to get into branding and commercial photography. And the reason for that is because, because of all of the stuff that I had learned in these marketing positions mm -hmm. that I had held, I knew the importance of branding and because I was building a brand that was more personal, I just kind of fell in this space of personal branding, which at the time um, wasn't, at least to my knowledge, as popular as it is now. Now you see so many solo entrepreneurs who are like the face of their brand and really out there um, mm -hmm. 
branding themselves. And at that time, it wasn't as much the case. And so I started to have, and, and I firmly believe that because of that personal branding, um, that, that helps with inquiries and it helps with getting really, attracting really great clients. And so I started to get questions from other photographers and small business owners in town about how I was doing that, like how I was um, working to build this business that was consistently attracting like high dollar clients. And not only that, but like really great clients. I very rarely had a negative experience with a client. And so I kind of started helping other people, mostly just with like, you know, taking some photos for them so they could use it on their social media, um, talking a little bit about educational type things on Instagram and realized that it, seemed like there was a major market for that. And so I really shifted my business more toward that personal branding um, and started marketing my photography services to other entrepreneurs so I could help them with photos, with what they were supposed to, you know, needed to be posting on social media to do basically what I had did, what I had done. And um, in doing that, I would have these sessions with other entrepreneurs and realize that like, I just wanted to sit down and like have coffee with these people and talk about their businesses and so many of them have these incredible businesses, but they were feeling really stuck with like scaling or, you know, making more money or working less. Like they had gotten to the point where they just couldn't, um, they couldn't possibly like have more on their plate, but they did, they needed to make more money. They needed more time with their family, all of those things. And so that's the long roundabout answer to kind of how I got into that personal branding photography space and then started moving into education to try and help these people um, just build businesses that supported their lifestyle a little bit more as opposed to having their lifestyle have to revolve around their business. Um, And so what that looked like was starting to introduce like some digital courses and some mentoring and coaching, a mastermind group. Um, I have a studio space in town that I rent to local photographers who are maybe some of, some of them have been in business a long time and some of them are just getting started, but, um, you know, maybe they can't, or it doesn't make sense for them to have their own space, but they can rent mine on an hourly basis and, um, have a session there. So yeah, there's a lot of different legs to my business at this point, but it all really just supports other entrepreneurs, specifically women business owners in the creative Mm -hmm. space. Um, to help them grow their brand and their business to the point where it doesn't run their life as much as it was before. Yeah, I love that. I, I, you're kind of my like prototypical like 2020 kind of like creator solo entrepreneur, right? <laughs> I mean, I'm sure you have like contractors and people you collaborate with, but like you have multiple streams of revenue. You're you're, you're mm-hmm. leveraging these free tools that have emerged, these digital platforms and social media. Um, and you just got your hands in a lot of things, but it all sort of like comes together as, as Maddie Pichon. I think it's great. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so let's talk about that concept. Cause I think the, in, uh, whether it be the podcast, the course, the coaching, I think there are a lot of folks who have, who are either who have done this successfully or are pursuing this. Mm-hmm. And so it's also becoming, I think, a pretty noisy, pretty crowded space. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And so how do you like talk us about, I think you have a pretty clear like brand ethos of what you stand for and what you try to encourage others to stand for. How do you, how do you stand out amongst all the noise? Yeah. Well, I, you're right. It is very noisy, but at the same time, I so firmly believe that anybody who, well, really anybody period has some kind of magic inside them and some kind of knowledge that needs to get out into the world. And that's not to say that there aren't people who all kind of have that same, um, uh, thing that makes them special, the, the, you know, the thing that they know, because so for example, I feel like I, um, what, what I know and what I share about personal branding, that's kind of my thing. There's a million other people who do the exact same thing, but that's okay because we all share it a little bit differently. Mm-hmm. Our personalities are different. Um, the way that we approach things, the way that we teach things are different. And as somebody who, um, didn't necessarily always excel in certain classes, like in in school and stuff. I, I know that the way that something is delivered is almost more important than what is actually being taught and being delivered. And so anytime that I work with a client who 
feels like they don't have anything to share or it's already been done or, you know, someone else is doing it better than them. That's usually what I come back to is, yeah, somebody else maybe is doing it, but they're not doing it the way that you would. And there's somebody out there who needs to hear what you have to say the way you have to say it. And that's what's going to make all the difference in their life. And so when you think of it more like that, it almost becomes... Um, it becomes kind of silly that you're not talking, that you're not talking more about it and teaching and, um, you know, living that way. And it also can feel a little bit selfish, like, oh gosh, I'm not sharing my knowledge with the world because I'm a little bit nervous that somebody is going to say, you know, what, what is she talking about? What does she know? Who does she think she is? Which quite frankly, they're probably not going to say. And if they do, who cares? Yeah. 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 Yep. Yep. Um, so what would you say to like a core thesis of the show is that leaders, you know, come in all different shapes and sizes and there's not one way to lead. And, but it's probably fair to say a, a lot of leaders tend to maybe be of the charismatic type, or they definitely mm-hmm. have things they want to share. They're very comfortable getting out there, whether it be a social media or a podcast or a stage or whatever. So mm-hmm. when you think about branding and leadership, what would you tell a leader who's maybe like, I don't know if I have a brand or I don't know what to say or how to say it. Um, what would you tell to them to how to get there? Would you describe it their magic out? Yeah, I think, and, and I've even had to work on this a lot lately with myself because I am, I'm very much on the charismatic side. And so while that's great, um, it can also be, it, it can be draining to feel like in order to show up, I constantly have to be, um, kind of like talking about, you know, rainbows and unicorns and happiness and like all of the, all of these like fun things. Um, and I, I oftentimes have to remind myself to come back to a place of just being a little bit more, more grounded in what I'm teaching and understanding that at the end of the day, what can I do to help? And I would say if somebody is feeling nervous about like putting their face out there or, um, showing up, like actually showing up on social media can be so nerve wracking to so many people. Ask yourself, what is it that you can do to help? What do your people need? What can you teach and be really rooted and grounded in that? And I think that, I think that that can really help us, um, get past the fears a little bit of, physically showing up and, and, and showing up as ourselves when we know like we, we do have something special to offer um, and just coming back to that place of education and that place of helping. Yeah, that's good. So, um, you know, like I said earlier, you don't have probably full-time employees in your business, mm-hmm. but probably do more like collaborations and, and, and contractors and, mm-hmm. but you've added this coaching element. Uh, so I know, talk us about that. Talk us through that because you're leading these women entrepreneurs through your coaching, maybe not directly in in the sense of where they're employed by you, but certainly a leadership role. They look to you as a leader, as a coach, Um, walk through how that feels for you and and, and what that looks like in terms of your business. Yeah. It's been more fulfilling than I ever could have imagined. Uh, And it's the same feeling that I used to get, like I said, when I was, you know, leaving a a photo session where we were just kind of chatting about somebody's business. And I was maybe sharing with them, like some tips that I had learned over the years and to like, see that light bulb go on and see them kind of realize like, Oh my gosh, maybe it doesn't have to be as hard as I'm making it. Maybe I can, you know, create some efficiencies here and through the mastermind program that I do and some of the individual coaching too, it, to, it's being able to see that, but like at a little bit more scale and also mm-hmm. being able to facilitate these relationships with that the women have with each other um, has been really cool too. being able to bring people together who have different genius zones and different things that they really excel at and um, watching them kind of connect and figure out, well, I can do this really well and you can do that really well. And how can we work together? Um, so that's been really, really cool. I've also realized that um, in, in most creative spaces, I think, especially when it comes to women, they're not lacking in ideas and they're not lacking in, um, you know, plans and dreams and goals for their business. A lot of the time they're just lacking in confidence or having someone in their corner cheering them on saying like, no, you actually can do this. That's actually a very good idea. You can do it. 
Yeah. Um, and a lot of the time that's my role as their coach. It's not necessarily to give them all these great ideas. They have amazing ideas. They just need mm-hmm. to be told that it's worth it. Yeah, that's so good. In, in last week's episode, uh, we talked to a woman named Laurel, who is a remote work consultant. And it's something she's been doing for long before COVID, long before remote work became, you know, the thing. Yeah. Uh, and it was sort of, she said she went through this imposter syndrome of realizing mm-hmm. like, actually, I'm good at this. Like, I know this, yeah. like businesses can help me. And she works with Microsoft and Slack and Zoom on like teaching these companies how to do remote work. And I imagine I don't know how you couldn't go through some of that too. And thinking I ran a business and it's going well. And now other people want to hear me talk about, you know, how I ran my business. Like, have you gone through any of that? Like, how do you, how do you push that confidence for yourself as a leader? Oh my gosh. Yes. And I think for a while I maybe thought that like, Oh, when I get to a certain point that imposter syndrome will be like, I won't have to deal with that anymore. Yeah, and I think I've just, no, I think I've just realized that like, it just, beca- it just becomes different and you maybe, you maybe get a little bit better at recognizing it and handling it. But imposter syndrome is forever <laughs> because at the end of the day, I think all of us just kind of feel like, well, I'm just, I'm just me. Like, I'm just Maddie. There's nothing special there. What, you know, what do I have to offer? Um, but again, I, it's always coming back to that place of, um, how can I help and reminding yourself, like you said, I have created success for myself. I have created success, um, or helped facilitate success with other businesses. So I do have something special to offer. Maybe it's not for everybody and that's okay, but it's for some people. And so it's worth it to just to keep showing up. And again, that doesn't mean that it's easy every day. And that doesn't mean that it's not uncomfortable. There've been a lot of situations, especially lately. 2020 has been a weird year (laughs) where there's a lot of uncomfortable, but it's always been worth it. And I've, you know, I've been in business, granted my business has changed a lot, but I've been in business for nine years and it's always been worth it to kind of push through that and do it anyway. Cool. That's good. Good advice. I wanted to shift gears a little bit and ask you about you mentioned 2020 and being a weird year and sort of yeah. social social media in our present day. Uh, I know there's this new, like, I haven't watched it yet, but this new Netflix uh, documentary out about uh, social media and some of the fears. I and... watched it last night. Oh, you did? Oh, did. so very timely. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. So I've not watched it yet. I watched the trailer. Um, and I sort of had this love-hate relationship with social media in the sense of, yeah in many ways, our, my first company in nine clouds, it's how we built the business, uh, today as lemonly. It's how we sort of get our word out. And, um, often, you know, clients are hiring us to create content that will go on their social media. Right. So it's, a, I have to recognize it's a revenue. These tools bring business to us. Um, mm-hmm. but then sometimes I'm just like, gosh, I just want to quit it and just walk away. Right. Oh, like, mm-hmm. yep. and so for like, for, for mental health and for, for just like separating, you know, work and, and life. Uh, how do you think through that? Because it's a big part of your business. It's not only how you sometimes make revenue, but get, get your word out. Right. Absolutely. This has been, and obviously I watched this documentary last night. So like hugely top of mind just in the last 24 hours. (laughs) Um, but something that I've been thinking about so much lately, because so much of what's on social media right now is not unicorns and rainbows. It's, it's tough and it's, very opinionated and it's two sides that are never going to agree. And that can be really draining on anybody, um, on anybody. So I've done a couple of different things and I, and I kind of feel too, like that this is, it's an ebb and flow because I'll go through periods where I'm like, wow, I feel like I have so much balance right now. Like I'm doing a very good job of, of, um, not listening to the noise. And then I'll have other, you know, it kind of starts to creep back in. Like, mm-hmm. oh, suddenly I'm obsessively checking my email on my phone again, and I shouldn't be doing that, that sort of a thing. Um, but when I'm, when I'm functioning well, um, I have all my notifications turned off. I've just come to the realization that unless somebody is sending me a text or calling me, it's not that important that it needs to take my attention away from whatever I'm working on. Um, so all the notifications are turned off. So I'm not seeing like those little red bubbles all day long. Yep. Um, I at one point took email off of my phone and I honestly need to do that again because it's gotten a little out of control again, <laughs> but just being able to um, have pockets throughout the day where I'm actually sitting down and working at my computer and not just like kind of haphazardly checking it throughout the day. Um, because I've noticed that when I'm doing that, I'm not doing my best work anyway. Um, 
I did take Facebook off of my phone, so I can't just like mindlessly scroll. Um, and then just this morning, I realized, you know, I was still pulling up Facebook on my computer and scrolling and seeing mm-hmm. a lot of this like discourse taking place that was really grating on me. Yep. And so I installed this um, app, <laughs> I guess, that eliminate is called the newsfeed eradicator and it eliminates your newsfeed. It gives you a motivational quote. And there's no newsfeed. And because I, I do like Facebook groups a lot, sure. but I was logging into Facebook and seeing my newsfeed and spending 20 minutes there instead of being in my groups where there was actual really good dialogue taking place. Sure. And so now I don't have a newsfeed and I will just go to my groups and I hope that that works that the way that I have it in my head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you, you're right. It's, it's sort of this like kind of wicked cocktail where it's like because of COVID, because of social distancing, because of, you know, mm-hmm. we're not traveling. We, in one way, we need some human interaction. So we totally. crave it through these social platforms. But that's also the same thing that's feeding all this content and fake news and, and just mm-hmm. like negative, negative talk. So it's a weird yeah. combo, like how to separate the two. It's like kind of this love hate relationship. I just, it is. I think it's also important, you know, understanding as people get a little bit more fed up with social media, yes, social media is an incredible business tool or it can be when used appropriately, Um, but it's also important to not put all your eggs in one basket. You know, growing something like an email list is hugely important right now, especially, you know, in the news lately, they've been talking about banning TikTok and, you know, what if that were to happen with Instagram and that's where the majority of your marketing takes place. So just having, again, a Midwest backup plan is not a bad (laughs) idea. Yeah, you bet. Well, let's touch on that briefly, uh, kind of the next phase of the business, because in some ways you've clearly already in a couple of years have iterated and not pivoted, but just kept, kept adding things to Mm -hmm. your, to your business. Uh, but I also know you're a person who like sets goals and, and, and you, you achieve them. So what does this look like in three, five years? I mean, it's hard. So much of it is, is like trend based as like new tools emerge and change, but like, what do you want Maddie Pichon to look like in five years? Yeah. Um, I lately both. So my husband is not um, really involved in my business. Um, like specifically, but he's my husband. And so he's certainly a huge support. And when we opened white space, the studio space, he was, he was very involved with that and he continues to be like really excited. And so we have talked a lot lately about like what that looks like going forward and how, um, how we can potentially grow that and use it to kind of facilitate the creative community in Sioux Falls. And so I would love for that to be a bigger part of the business going forward. Um, I would love, so currently it's a studio space. I, in a perfect world, in a dream world, I would love to have a space that's both kind of something that photographers could use for shooting, but also um, a space that could be used for like small gatherings. Mm. I think because COVID has had, has forced a lot of people home, um, there's this weird gap in the market or just a need in general for not necessarily like a formal office space, but just a a place where people can still get together in a small group and like have a meeting or have a collaboration session when like a zoom call won't necessarily do it. Um, And certainly just as a, as a photographer, I know that there is a lack of spaces in town uh, or not necessarily a lack, but there still continues to be a need for spaces in town for photographers to um, collaborate and create and do really amazing things in uh, in an area where nine months out of the year it's snowing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So to be able to go inside. So I would love for white space to be um, a bigger part of the business. And I would, um, I also really want to continue with the coaching side. I, that continues to be something that just like brings me so much joy. And I've always felt like anything that feels exciting to you and anything that makes you happy, like definitely uh, deserves to kind of be followed. And so yeah, that's, that's good a, a huge, yeah. So that's a huge part of where I would like to go. Um, and honestly, as much as I love photography, I love it more when I'm shooting less. And I think a lot of that is just where I'm at in life right now with three little kids. And, mm-hmm. um, so being able to only work with the clients that I want to work with, only do the projects that I want to do, um, is also, I think a big part of what success looks like in the next few years. Cool. That's great. And, I, and you know, I, I know you said the 
the space maybe not used exactly as you intended as COVID happened, but there's still obviously a need for private sessions or people just to get in, use it, get out. Um, Absolutely. We've been, I at least was shocked at how well, because we literally opened in February and by the end of February, we were like in lockdown. So mm -hmm. I have been very pleasantly surprised that the space continues to um, be rented by a lot of area photographers. And so I kind of have in the back of my head, like if it can, if it can be successful during a pandemic, like it is yeah. likely a pretty good business model. So we're excited to do more with it. Yeah, I, I hope and believe when, when, when it's safe to gather again, there's going to be a huge sort of windfall back where we all want to hang out, give each other hugs. and Totally. And so yes. That'll be, that'll be good. <laughs> Um, well, let's transition. Let's end with a, a little rapid fire, like to get to yeah. better understand um, what makes leaders tick and kind of what makes you unique. So I don't know if you're a reader or not, but what's a book you've read currently reading or something you've read this year that you'd want to recommend? I recommend the book Do Less to Just About Everyone. It's by Kate Northrup and it's about um, like how you, how you can basically set up your life to achieve more while doing less. And it's it changed my life. I recommend it to absolutely everyone, especially women. It's fantastic. Do less. I like that. Um, so you had a baby in the middle of, of COVID, uh, but 2020 has been a stressful year in general. How do you like to unplug? How do you de-stress? Yeah. Well, a lot of what I talked about with making sure there, there's no notifications on my phone, that's a big part of it. Just making sure that the temptation isn't there. Um, otherwise though, I have been trying to get better with, um, meditating honestly and even if it's not like traditional meditation just like being alone with no stimulation I think is really really important and honestly really hard and uncomfortable and um, something that I certainly need to get better at but it always is helpful yeah it's a, a muscle you have to kind of build and train oh, it yeah, feels so totally. weird at first but yeah I'd yeah. say I'm still in the early phases of that Same. Uh, mother of three now any parenting advice you'd give the listeners um, I think just understanding each individual kid and how they function individually. You know, we we just added our third and it's already become so apparent that like, even though these three humans all came from us and they're all being raised in the same house, they are so different and they, um, they respond to different things when it comes to discipline and even love and attention. And so um, just making, making a point to, parent each kid the the best way for them and not necessarily the, the way that was the best for your kid before. And that's been sure. a learning curve for me. Yeah. Right. You want to follow the playbook and then it doesn't work the next time. No, though. they just like, yeah. Um, I feel like you'll have a good answer to this. We asked this question at Lemonly, what's your superpower? The one thing you can do better than everyone else. Mm, I think helping people believe that they have a superpower. I, <laughs> I hope that just from what I share online or the conversations that I have with people privately, my hope is always that they walk away from that thinking, maybe I do have something special to share. You know, maybe I should be a little bit more vocal about that thing that I know how to do better than anyone else, because I think there's so much amazing knowledge out there that's not being shared because we're nervous and that mm. I'm not okay with that. <laughs> that's great. That's good. Um, and all leaders we know are shaped and influenced by other leaders. So uh, mentors or leaders that have influenced you, maybe you know them or read about them that inspire you. Yeah. Um, well, certainly my parents, they were both in leadership roles. My, um, my mom at a university and my dad at a bank. And um, while their leadership styles, especially my dad's, I think are different from mine. I respect them so much. Like he He's probably a traditional baby boomer in the fact that like he, he worked at the same company from when he graduated hmm. college to when he retired. Wow. Um, yeah. And he, um, by the time he retired, was in a, a major leadership position. And just watching him navigate that, and especially when it came to, yeah, the people relationships and how that can sometimes be really draining on him. But he did it anyway, and he did it really well. Um, so certainly my parents. And then um, honestly, by the time I, when I left um, the company that I was at before I went full time, it was the the CEO is it was and is Natalie Eisenberg, and she is just a force. And I I look up to her so so much as a mother and as a business owner. 
Um, I think that she does such a good job of balancing all of the different pieces of her life to make it all work together and not necessarily, um, you know, when I'm at work, it's about work. And when I'm home, it's about home. She just, she understands that, no, it's actually a lot more of a combination and that's okay. Um, but she always puts her family first. And I just, I have so much respect for her. That's great. That's great. Well, this is, this is fun. I, I love the, just the thought and the intent that you put both in your business, but also in your content. And I, I know that you're genuinely inspiring many, many, uh, entrepreneurs and women to go start businesses. You inspire me. I love watching. I learn from you. So Thank thanks for you. coming on the show. Yeah. Thanks, John. Thank you so much for having me. This was great. Yeah. It's great to catch up. Take care, Maddie. Thanks. All right. That was our conversation with Maddie Pashong. Such a great, great conversation. I just love Maddie inspires me to really bring my full authentic self to the work that I do. So I hope you learned a thing or two from Maddie. Again, thank you for listening to the Lean More podcast. Remember, we drop new episodes every Thursday and you can listen to the show wherever you listen to podcasts, Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, wherever it is. So go onto that platform, click the subscribe button, and I hope you enjoy the next episode. Take care.